Good evening. Uh, welcome to the official launch for Latinx uh, Breakbeat Poet Series Anthology, volume number four, um, out of Haymarket. We are glad to have everyone who signed up uh, to join us in this discussion slash reading slash celebration. Uh, we're celebrating a book that was co-edited by myself, uh, Jose, Jose Olivares, and Felicia Rose Chavez, Latinx. Um, we're gonna have uh, a few people present some poems from the book, some original poems as well. Um, I want to mention uh, a thank you to Haymarket Books for setting this up on their YouTube channel, uh, to Rigoberto Gonzalez for, for agreeing to moderate the discussion, to Raquel Salas Rivera uh, for coming through and shipping in, Dianeli Antigua uh, for coming through as well, and Janelle Pineda for coming through and joining us as part of the discussion and celebration. I'm gonna just read a, a portion of the introduction um, that I wrote uh, with the help of Jose and, and Felicia um, to the book. And we pretty much kind of let the poems in the book speak for themselves outside uh, of the introduction. But again, welcome and, and uh, we hope you have a good evening and we look forward to the discussion um, after the readings uh, and the questions that you might be posting up on, on the YouTube channel for us to kind of navigate. So here's a part, and it's taken right from the back of the book. If poetry is truly a decolonial practice, then this anthology lifts its lyrical machete, its formalistic authority, its innovative approach toward language, its queerness, its non-binary they, its sense of lineage, family, tradition, pride, and refreshingly, its blackness. You will find poets in conversation, in celebration, in protest, in demonstration, in a collective breakbeat that's in informed by ritual, but also a resistance to the normalized ways of looking at stanzas, patria, sex, gender, patriarchy, and nationalism. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-editor, Jose Olivares, and we're gonna we're about to set this uh, launch and celebration off. Cool. What's up, everybody? My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, please, real quick, wherever you are at, uh, put your hands together for Willy Perdomo for that uh, introduction. I love the intro to the book, and I'm honored that I was able to co-edit the book with Felicia Ros Chavez, as well as Willy Perdomo. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to start by reading a poem from someone else, and then I'm going to read one of my own poems, and then I'm going to get out of the way because we have an incredible, incredible lineup of poets to present to you tonight. Um, and then after that, we're going to have Rigoberto Gonzalez join us to moderate a conversation. And then after that, we're going to open the floor up for questions from you all. So uh, I can't see the YouTube page right now, but I hope that you're using the chat function on the YouTube page. I hope that you're sending us your questions and hopefully we'll be able to get back to them. Um, so I'm gonna start by reading a poem by Roque Dalton. Um, I'm gonna read it in English first, translated by Jack Hirschman. This is one of my favorite, favorite poems of all time. This poem is called Like You. Like you, I love love, life, the sweet smell of things, the sky blue landscape of January days. And my blood boils up and I laugh through eyes that have known the buds of tears. I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry like bread is for everyone. And that my veins don't end in me, but in the unanimous blood of those who struggle for life love, little things, landscape and bread, the poetry of everyone. Cool. I'm going to read it in Spanish too. Como tú. Yo, como tú, amo el amor, la vida, el dulce encanto de las cosas, el paisaje celeste de los días de enero, También mi sangre bulle y río por los ojos que han conocido el brote de las lágrimas. Creo que el mundo es bello, 
que la poesía es como el pan de todos y que mis venas no terminan en mí, sino en la sangre unánime de los que luchan por la vida, el amor, las cosas, el paisaje y el pan, la poesía de todos. So that's Roque Dolte, Roque Dalton. Um, look up his work if you're not familiar with it. Then I'm going to read one of my poems and then I'll get out of your way. Uh, the title of this poem is Getting Ready to Say I Love You to My Dad, It Rains. I love you, dad. I say to the cat. I love you, dad. I say to the sky. I love you, dad. I say to the mirror. It rains and my mom's plants open their mouths. My dad stays on the couch. Maybe the couch opened its mouth and started eating my dad. I love you, dad. I say to the couch, its tongue working my dad like a puppy. I hear the rain fall and think the city is drinking or making itself clean. I am here with my dad and the TV and the TV drones on and on. So I'm not sure I hear it. My dad grunting and nodding. Not the mushy stuff I was expecting. Neither of us cry, no hug or a kiss, just a grunt and a nod. I love you, dad. I say to my dad, we sit together and watch TV. Outside it rains. My dad turns the volume up. The city is drunk. The city is singing badly in the shower. I killed the plant once because I gave it too much water. Lord, I worry that love is violence. My dad is silent and our relationship is not new or clean. I killed the plant once because I didn't give it enough water. My dad and I watch TV on a rainy day. We rinse our mouths with this water. Cool. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on right back to my co-editor. Please y'all, wherever you are, I want you to make noise like we're in the same room together. Give it up for Willy Perdomo. You, thank you, Jose. So I'm gonna share a poem uh, from an anthology called uh, Puerto Rican Poetry by a guy named Roberto Marquez. That he put together this anthology, but he translated uh, all the poems in it. And it's from kind of that, what is called Aboriginal on the subtitle of the book up to more or less contemporary uh, Puerto Rican poetry. And this is by a poet named Marcos Rodriguez Frese. Bible Poetics. And this is a translation. Suspend the song. Live by vital verse. For once, listen to me. Speak without trope. The heart doesn't melt. It stops in horror and from death or breaks from wars and weeping. Listen, that first of all, then unleash your tongue, your fists if necessary. Suspend song, please, and speak normally or hardly at all. And to me too, though I am already on the blacklist and the red of those loving peace, bread and freedom for all. For those of us changing the world with a few swift kicks of light, with words of flesh and bone to the daily dog of our own death, whenever someone falls in vain. So I'm gonna read something that I just started working on. I don't know whether to call this this, that, and the third, or talking a good one. So when you come up on the on the chat or the YouTube, let me know which, which one you think I should, I should call this project. This, that, and the third, or talking a good one. This one I'll give you from the top of my dome, no copy, no bootlegs. My last line took a road shape more like a wrong turn down the right block, but it's too early to pull out the scale. Picture me a pigeon surveying a square in old Havana from the top of Marthe's bronze head while the sun rocks the straw kango. Picture me coming up for air in a free mix of blackness and all I want in the down home is the last word in the glass of spring water. Let me ask you, and I'm going to ask you again. If a block of ice knows its lifespan and heat, how long must I wait on a rope's tug? I swear, these months have been sincere. The big eye watches the hoods and makes avenue plans. And meanwhile, who got the best bag of illness plans? The dark has a list of projects. There's a duplicate cry on the bench, a gang of hawks circled above me. Revolution has, has never seen its own reflection. 
Like I said at the top of the show, I'm going to run it with this dream. True, it could be that the empire is yours for the taking, but no matter what you cut it with, this heart is not public. And I just dropped these bars in the middle of a parade. Now back to your change. Are you ready to give it away with all those ashes in your face? Grandma never lies. She's in front of the TV right now watching the sky give birth. Didn't I tell you, boy? Didn't I tell you you're going to need a metro car for that dream? And the city should start taxing reciprocity, she added. But if you decide to run from the badge, grab a fistful of deceased leaves. And when the, sand, and the, when the sun sand runs quick, you better remember what you learned during story hour. This morning's rally of cause is a perfect example of a plan. I ain't talking about your legacy panels. I'm saying I'm crazy familiar with the art of choking. I've been invisible to more history than I asked for. So I ask you again, what's the use in waiting until tomorrow? Give it up for Willie Bedzomo one more time, wherever you're at. I want you to make hella noise. All right, y'all. Coming up first, we have Dianeli Antigua. Dianeli Antigua is a Dominican American poet and educator born and raised in Massachusetts. Her debut collection, Ugly Music from Yes Yes Books, was the winner of the Pamet River Prize and the 2020 Whiting Award. She received her, her BA in English from the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where she won the Jack Kerouac Creative Writing Scholarship and received her MFA at NYU, where she was awarded a Global Research Initiative Fellowship to Florence, Italy. She is the recipient of additional fellowships from Canto Mundo, Community of Writers, and the Fine Artwork Center Summer Program. Her work has been nominated for both the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net. Her poems can be found in Washington Square Review, Bennington Review, The Adroit Journal, and elsewhere. Her heart is in Brooklyn. Please, y'all, uh, wherever you are, once again, I want you to give all your love and all your energy to Dianeli Antigua. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you, Lily. Um, thank you all watching um, at home. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, first, I'm going to read a poem by Melissa Lovado Oliva um, from the Latinx um, anthology, and then I'll read one of my own. Petition to get all white girls to stop wearing hoop earrings. There's a petition to get all white girls to stop wearing hoop earrings. I didn't know this was a thing, except when I thought about it being a thing, like when I rejected my hoops in my backpack once in the middle of the school day, because I thought I heard someone say a slur I was sure was over. My lover told me about this, showed me the article, the comments, the thread. He has big holes in his ears left over from gauges, there in the shape of little screaming mouths. These are silly, I'd say. These are fun. Last summer, he threw the earrings into the ocean because he told me white people ruin everything. Even though all the girls he chose to really love are named Lauren or Haley, I say this like my name isn't Melissa, like my name couldn't wrap itself securely around Lauren's neck or Haley's wrists, like it couldn't slide itself neatly through any of their earlobes and hang there all day belonging. Um, I, I love that poem and Melissa's also from Massachusetts. I wanted to shout her out here. So hi, Melissa, wherever you are. Um, and I'm gonna be reading my poem, Immigration Story. I was 10 years old when I read about the boy whose mother drowned in the ocean. It was in the Scholastic News, the aluminum boat leaving Cuba, the shipwreck, the 10 more dead with her, the boy floating on an inner tube until rescued by fishermen. His face was on the front page of the magazine and I wanted to kiss 
this paper cheek. His name is Elian, and today he turns 23. My mother shows me a picture of his mother. She is beautiful in the way all mothers were in the 90s, all bangs, high-waisted jersey shorts. And I don't know what it is to lose a mother yet. I won't see her scoop water from a sinking boat. My mother came here on a plane and I thank a God, a different island, a different year, a baby girl, not me, in her arms. Elian went back to Cuba and I have never visited the island I'm from and I feel like a bitch because all I did was read a story then retell it on this page. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Dianelli Antigua. Um, wow. All right. So we're going to keep it moving because we want to make sure that we leave time for questions at the end. Coming up next is Janelle Pineda. Janelle Pineda is a Los Angeles-born poet and the daughter of Salvadoran immigrants. She is an editor and translator for La Piscucha magazine, a multilingual arts, literature, and culture magazine created by Salvadoran writers. Janelle has performed her poetry internationally in both English and Spanish. Her poems have been published in Wildness, Latino Book Review, and The Wandering Song, Central American Writing in the United States, among others. She is currently pursuing an MA in creative writing and education at Goldsmiths University of London as a Marshall Scholar. Please, y'all, wherever you are, put your hands together for Janelle Pineda. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here and to be sharing some poems. Um, I'm going to start with um, a poet whose work I admire a lot. Um, it's Fernandez, who is a Inglewood raised um, Mexican born trans non-binary visual artist and writer. Um, this is also from the anthology. It's called Reasons Men Build Walls. My lover fears me. There is too much cumbia, too much Selena in my walk, too much Frank Ocean in my loving, too much storm in our summer kiss. I am too much sugar pyramid on his tongue, too much Holy Spirit, too many ancestors talking in a crowded room. My lover fears me. He only sees threat in my soil brown eyes, a pending earthquake, a possession or a steep cliff, his imminent dive out of the closet. He fears the nature of my wild harvest, the way I am hard fruit cracked open, soft inside and his body drools. He is not used to the howling woman on my tongue, not used to myth being truth. Of course, I'm a threat. My pulping heart is a caution sign, a red light he dare not cross because he is not a man used to the elements, the ways of the earth, the way my love like fire ignites a forest. My presence lifts him between his thighs like wind does dust. He is not used to this transient, borderless love, like sound bath or universe energy cascading into cranium, jolting him into dance with me, past nirvana and all of God's children. He is a coward, a divide that swore it would let me travel across its height without papeles. My lover is a conditioned man since the start of time, a colonizer that fears the Pima Indian in me, the eagle, the flight, the ritual of me. He fears the two bear earth child, the savage, the taramara in me, fears the two bear human in me, the two masculine female coalescence that makes me a god, the healer and warrior in me. He tried to sever parts of me during his inner war, tried to slice me with his love like a molten silver sword. He tried to fling my soft womb inflamed into abyss, but with my too much Bitty bitty bum bum in my hip, too much Frank Ocean in my lovin', being too much divine and storm in the summer, being too good of a shape, serpentine shapeshifter, I dodged and shattered a fragile masculinity. 
I, the two-spirit beast, am the reason why men build walls, borders on their fingertips. I am the catalyst for why men don't shed tears, don't open up. To lovers, I will always be a wild criatura, a danger, a disease, a howling spirit, a haunted house, awakening, 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 and God forbid I awaken a man in our era of silence and crosses. Yet although the man that swore he loved me left me running, abandoned me, wings outstretched, crown in hand, I hair flipped, knowing that silence is the only way men will ever know how to love because a freedom like me exists. So that's Bayard Mendes. Um, I definitely recommend you check out their work. Um, now I'm gonna read a poem of mine. Um, it's important to me because I think as Latinx writers, as, as children of immigrants or immigrants ourselves, we often stand writing a lot about trauma and a lot of tough, tough experiences, but I'm interested also in utopia. I'm interested in what, what more can we be and what more are we? Um, this poem's called In Another Life. The war never happened, but somehow you and I still exist. Like obsidian, we know only the memory of lava and not the explosion that created us. Forget the gunned down church, the burning flesh, the cabbage soup. There is no bus, there is no border, there is no blood. There are only sweet cornfields and mango skins, the turquoise house and clotheslines, a heaping plate of pasteles and curtido waiting to be disappeared into our bellies. In this life, our people are not things of silences, but whole worlds bursting into breath. Everywhere, there are children playing freely, clothed and clean. Mozote does not mean massacre and flowers bloom in every place shoes are left behind. My name still means truth. This time in a language my mouth recognizes, in a language I know how to speak. My grandmother is still a storyteller, although I am not a poet. In this life, I do not have to be. This poem somehow still exists. It is told in my mother's voice and she makes hurt dissolve like honey in hot water, manzanilla warming the throat. You and I do not find each other on another continent, grasping at each other's necks in search of home. We meet in a mercado, my arms overflowing with mame and danonas and together we wash them in river water. We watch sunset fall over a land we call our own and do not fear its taking. I bite into the fruit, mouth sucking seed from substance, pulling its veins from between my teeth. Our laughter echoes from inside the cave, one we are free to step outside of. We do not have to hide here. We do not have to hide anywhere. A torogos flies past my face and I do not fear it's flapping. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Janelle. Uh, when I was introducing Janelle, I meant to say that Janelle has a chapbook forthcoming with Haymarket Books. So please stay tuned and look out for that. Um, Give it up one more time for Janelle. That was, I love that poem. I love all these poems that the poets have shared so far. Um, coming up next is Raquel Salas Rivera. Raquel Salas Rivera is the 2018 2019 Poet Laureate of Philadelphia. They are the inaugural recipient of the Ambrosio Prize and the Laureate Fellowship, both from the Academy of American Poets. Their fourth book, 
Lo Terciario, the tertiary, was on the 2018 National Book Award long list and won the 2018 Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Poetry. Raquel loves and lives for Puerto Rico, Philadelphia, in a world free of white supremacy. Wherever you are, you already know what to do. I want you to clap so loud that Raquel can hear you out in Puerto Rico. Please, y'all, give it up for Raquel Salas Rivera. Hola. So Willie doesn't know I'm doing this, but I wrote a poem in response to a poem um, from Willie's uh, latest book. So I'm going to read Willie's poem, and then I'm going to read the poem in response, and then I'm going to read a translation of one of my poems, if that's okay. That's my heart right there by Willie Perdomo. We used to say, that's my heart right there, as if to say, don't mess with her right there as if don't even play, that's a part of me right there. In other words, okay, okay, that's a start of me right there. As if come that day, that's the end of me right there. As if push come to shove, I would fend for her right there. As if come what may, I would lie for her right there. As if come love to pay, I would die for that right there. Esa que besa mi corazón. With an epigraph by Willy Perdomo. We used to say, that's my heart right there. Esa que ves ahí, esa que ves ahí, esa que ves ahí, esa que ves ahí, besa ahí, esa que si besa ahí, esa que besa ahí. All right, and so because this is so long, I'm just going to read the translation. An open casket for a Puerto Rican obituary for Pedro Pietri. So it has an epigraph. Juan Miguel, Milagros, Olga, Manuel will right now be doing their own thing where beautiful people sing and dance and work together. Pedro Pietri. They worked with the rose between their teeth. They worked the three o'clock shift, closed drunken nights, fucked between boxes. They smoked. Sometimes they accused each other of hitting it too hard. Sometimes they acted trash. When they went to the fair across from Plaza, they ate Maybelline clouds and closed their eyes on cold cities. They lost uncles and didn't discuss funerals. Often they laughed cruelly at the dirty rain. They paid their rent without a contract. This, the only maybe stable payment, even if the checks stammered. They crowned their bevels with gold cardboard without swimming. They regularly smoked, gathered smoke, saliva, charcoal, and vinegar flies. With, they had a limber complexion, a padlock insecurity, wholesome cheekbones and tres monjitas merienda. They invaded a hotel that invaded a beach. They learned to cruise them all which name to see, which fences opened without pliers. They mixed the rochino and tostones. At a certain hour through the door screens, you could hear Abuela's phone. The car alarm went off and the whole block lit up with farks. They anticipated the sale of the house. They painted the bars or called Jose and offered to seal the roof. They went to walk at the linear park. They changed their diet, avoided seafood, wore sunscreen on their knuckles. They made dinner, they killed roaches. They cut the front on the expressway. They complained from the tail end of the traffic jam. They kept the windows open so as not to waste gas. They smoked with their mouth on the filter and air on the flame. They rolled their receipts. They hammered the car horn until calor sounded like sol, until heat sounded like sun. They discovered tadpoles in the parking lot. They sat on the infertile fountain benches and opened their purse. They always had change, always my bad. They stole napkins and ketchup they carried between pens that read Santander, your bank. They strolled from Aaron to next in line. They landed after a full day on a night full of dishes. And in Kmart or Coco, they looked for the ATM near the sliding doors, telling their kid, don't touch that, it's expensive. They had family in Yabucoa. Mommy was too old to cook. They argued with their brothers about in-home care. The check was late and no one answered. New transportation was an event. The ferry, the lagoon, the paperwork advanced. They satisfied the quota. They balanced the checkbook. They prepared taxes. They knew well their partners' asymmetries. They helped Don Paco with his groceries. They spoke on the condominium stairs about those who left, those who stayed, the hardships of living here and there. They went to church, thanked God, kept an open mind, and look at her. They decapitated reputations. They sent arroz con gandules. They didn't know if they should stop on the way to San Juan. They memorized their social security, office code, luggage combination. They sat to watch TV and fell asleep. They saw the news while folding clothes. They turned off the water heater if no one was showering. 
Even if it always rained at four, they repeated this routine, surprise, crisis, and rescue. They ran to rip off clothespins, screaming la ropa, their hands in the air, strongholds against missile drops. They opened their palms to form a cup. They filled them with waterfall. They played on the rocks. They let loose slippery laughter. They took names into their mouths. They screamed, bajame la llave, lower the keys in the basket. They opened gates. They sat on the roof. They fixed their shirts. They made out and later sat in silence. They died and later died laughing. They splashed their faces. They asked for a ride and gave each other nicknames like flaco, gordo, pendejo, or cabron where beautiful people sing and dance and work together. Gracias. Wow. Give it up for Raquel one more time. Um, that was my mom clap. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you can hear it. <laughs> I was like, did I do that? Did I just unmute myself by accident? Um, bueno, coming up next, we have... Rigoberto Gonzalez. Rigoberto is going to read a poem of his own, and then he's going to um, moderate a discussion. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Rigoberto Gonzalez is the author of five books of poetry, most recently the Book of Ruin, published by Four Way Books. His 12 books of prose include two bilingual children's books, the three young adult novels in the Mariposa Club series, and the memoir Butterfly Boy, Memories of a Chicano Mariposa, which received the American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation. He also edited Camino del Sol, 15 Years of Latina and Latino Writing, Alurista's new and selected volume, Chicano Duende, a select anthology, and a 2019 issue of Plowshares, the recipient of Guggenheim, NEA, and USA Rolon Fellowships, a NIFA grant in poetry, the Lenore Marshall Prize from the Academy of, of American Poets, the Lambda Literary Award for Poetry, the Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, the Poetry Center Book Award, and the Barnes & Noble Writer for Writers Award. He is contributing editor for Poets and Writers Magazine. Currently, he is professor of English and director of the MFA program in creative writing at Rutgers Newark, the State University of New Jersey. In 2015, he received the Bill Whitehead Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Publishing Triangle. In 2020, he received the Penn Volcker Award given to a poet whose distinguished and growing body of work represents a notable and accomplished presence in American literature. Additionally, he serves as critic at large with the LA Times, is a member of the Writers' Council for the Center for Fiction, and sits on the boards of two national literary organizations, Zoglasia, a community for writers with disabilities, and the po Poetry Society of America, PSA. Please, y'all, give all your energy and all your love to Rigoberto Gonzalez. Okay, right from you. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, so glad to be here with all of you. And uh, thank you to all the readers. I feel that I've been invited to a very important and a very uh, critical spiritual space at the moment with everything that's happening. So thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to read a poem from my next collection of, of, of uh, poetry. And this is, uh, I'm going back to the border, although the border never really left me. Desert Lily. This white dress will not be worn again, says the wind, and the dress lets go its fondest memory, clinging to the clothesline as it made believe it was a kite. How it soared, gull-like, through the sky, how it cast a shadow independent of a body and escaped the human grasp like sunlight or a butterfly. The past is a prison anyhow, as our names, says the wind. The wind arrives not because it's called, but because it's forgotten. When it wails, it mocks the old women who cry for the things they lost. This dress will not be mourned, says the wind, and the dress comes alive even more. The ruffles on the hem opening and closing like the valves of a heart Pebbles and sand erode from the cloth and the white dress begins to flower once again. 
a desert lily that will glow with moonlight. This white dress, says the wind, belongs to no one. What strange freedom, this detachment from the living, from the scrutiny of eyes that covet or desire, from the touch and tug of human hands that value all they can possess or possibly destroy. This dress, this white dress can invent its own beauty for a change. It can dress itself. Here, a collar made of larva. Here, a scorpion for a buckle. So we're gonna get to the uh, uh, panel conversation. So I'm gonna ask our panelists, our readers to unmute so that they can chime in if they should feel the urge. So I'm gonna start with this question about the anthology. This anthology line next represents an exciting range of aesthetics and identities. It amplifies intersections of thought, beliefs, and ways of being in the world. And it's been a while since an ambitious gathering of poets has been realized by a single book. The book is an important literary message, but contained within are individual messages that each poet wants to send out to the general public. Can each of you articulate what that message would be from you? Well, I mean, as one of the co-editors of the anthology, I think it's important to recognize that when you do create anthologies, you are basically, one, engaging in a, in a kind of political act to begin with. Um, and the thing that you have to figure out is where does the anthology pivot? So if I think about um, some of the anthologies that I grew up with as a, as, a, as a young poet. So you say everything from Dudley Randall's uh, The Black Poets to uh, Pinero and Ayala Ding's New Eurekan Poetry um, to Leroy Jones's Amir Baraka's uh, Black Fire, all the way up to, say, right in this present moment, um, Melissa Castillo Garza's uh, um, Manteca, which is a very specific book about uh, Afro Latinx poetry. And what basically is that what I found is that the anthologists were trying to kind of create uh, a discussion. They were trying to create a level of resistance. But what I also found in some of the early anthologies that where anthologies pretend to be somewhat uh, inclusive. And this, this panel, for example, uh, the, the, um, the, the contributors that we have are just really a small sampling of what's out there. Uh, in terms of Latinx poetry, but where where those kind of anthologies seem to, where, what this anthology seems to do is fill the kind of empty spaces that were left by some of those early anthologies that seem to be uh, not as inclusive, uh, I think. So I think the, um, the the level of of defining what it means to be Latinx without any pretense toward authenticity is something that we were very conscious about in creating uh, the anthology. That range needed to be there. Um, there was also this idea that somehow uh, we needed to mix emerging poets, established poets, and poets who were publishing for the first time. Uh, there's a few poets here uh, in the anthology that are doing that. The question always remains, you know, how do you anthologize Latinidad without racializing Latinidad in uh, a collection of works? So, um, the hope is that you, you we start to create these kind of discussions using the the anthology as a vehicle for that discussion. Anybody else want to chime in, uh, Jose? Yeah, you know, I think definitely everything that Willie said. For me, um, one of the reasons that I said yes to this project is because I remember when I was beginning to write poems that it was not always like the tradition of Latinx literary writing or just writing period was not always readily accessible to me. Um, so it made a huge difference in my life when I started reading 
poets like Willy Perdomo and Sandra Cisneros and all these other people, right? Um, it helped me to see myself not just in a vacuum by myself, but also as part of a tradition. Um, so one of the things that I, I think is my hope for this book, to answer your question, Rigoberto, is that um, is that poets will be able to you know, see Janelle Pineda and put themselves in a tradition, right? And then trace Janelle's influences and see how how long our our kind of lineages are and how diverse, right? To your point, there's also, there's not just one aesthetic. I'm really proud of the fact that there's multiple aesthetics. So, you know, hopefully if you are like a punk Chicano poet, you know, you can find your people in the anthology and where, wherever you kind of fit in, you can kind of find your way into it, I hope. Thank you. This next question is for the readers. Your voices are quite a gift during this difficult time. I'm reminded of Brecht's famous lines, during the dark times where there also be singing. Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. And we're right in the middle of it. So how the current moment shapes our work is perhaps developing in real time and we will see the results of the experience not long from today. And I'm also certain that it will be quite compelling. I wanted to ask each of you, uh, how you perceive your work differently through the new lens of the global pandemic? Does it cast any new shadows or insights? Does the poet who wrote those words seem so far away from the person you are today? If so, in what ways? Uh, I'll, I'll answer first. Um, I, I, for me, it, it hasn't changed um, in some ways so drastically because of so much of my writing is uh, a response to trauma and like, you know, Hurricane Maria, you know, the Promesa Law. Um, so in a, in a way, at least my, my more recent work doesn't feel like such, a, it doesn't feel like such a break, but honestly the pandemic has me writing about trauma, but not, um, uh, not describing traumatic experiences, but actually, um, I've become very fascinated by snowshoe hares and how they respond to trauma because they, I'll keep it brief, but basically they, um, they have like a main predator that they're in a dynamic with and their body produces, they develop PTSD, their body produces a chemical that makes them breed less and they pass that message on to their children. And then their babies um, in turn also breed less and that actually forces lynxes and wolves and foxes to migrate and um, during the migration, like the years of migration, um, it allows the snowshoe hare to survive. And so trauma has become like a mechanism for the snowshoe hares to prolong their species um, by passing on trauma to their children. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about how animals respond to trauma and reading a lot about it in terms of like how we're surviving this moment. And, the different sort of coping mechanisms that we're each creating to survive this moment. And um, rather than like trying to judge those mechanisms, I'm thinking of them in relation to our survival. And um, so my poetry has shifted even more, I think towards like interior kind of and like how we're, how we're dealing with the larger thing, but in a more um, kind of like the interior processes of dealing with that. Janelle, yeah, I think that this moment has called on so many of us to move differently um, and to imagine what the world is going to continue moving like. And I know that so much of that has created a lot of uncertainty um, and grief and all, all sorts of different challenges for people. Um, and I think that for me, the thought of imagining alternate worlds of um, thinking about what other possibilities there are for the way that we live and engage one another is something that is really central to the ethic of my poetry. Um, and I think that in that poetry becomes just a, a place for healing, a place for telling stories. Hey, you know, this is what I'm going through. These are my stories, these are my truths um, and listening to each other. And I think there's a lot of power in that always um, because right now it's, it's the pandemic, but there's been, you know, everyone has things going on. There's always different crises that are affecting um, the most marginalized people, the most vulnerable people. Um, I think now it's just a, a more collective experience that it's global. Um, but I think that we just have to keep telling stories and listening and 
using that as a way to imagine the kind of world that we want to move into um, as we move forward. Thank you. Janine? Yeah, I want to piggyback um, kind of what Raquel was saying um, about moving more, like, more towards the interior life. And I feel like I've been doing almost the opposite, where I've been looking a lot at the exterior um, or what is out outside of, of my own psyche a little bit more. I think a lot of the work that I already do in writing does deal with, with trauma. Um, and I do a lot of interior work uh, already. Um, and because this feels um, just so large, I, I almost feel like I can't just contain all of it within me. So I do have to um, start looking outwardly um, to start start writing and to start getting an inspiration. Um, I've been finding a lot of joy in the domestic, um, and really small things like putting dishes in the dishwasher, um, taking a shower with my favorite soap, um, doing laundry, um, and kind of with the backdrop of all of those really simple, like mundane things is this global pandemic and just how those things are opposite of one another, but at the same time, they coexist. So I've been thinking a lot about those two different worlds and how I'm kind of like at the middle of that and how, how we all are um, kind of living these interior lives, but at the same time, we're all experiencing this together. So I've been trying to convey that in my poetry a bit more. Um, I will confess I haven't been writing as much as I, I would be, um, but you know, I find in a victory in just getting one line of poetry out or even just if I find something to be inspiring, you know, jotting it down real quick and then returning back to it later. Um, but for the most part, I've really just been turning to reading during this time. I find a lot of comfort in the words of other poets, um, you know, attending readings, virtual readings, um, and then also, you know, reading through this anthology. And um, I've, I've just been really trying to um, have other voices involved too, you know, because there's a lot of quiet right now and um, there's a lot of comfort in, in, in each other's voices. Thank you. I mean, certainly now that our physical spaces have become smaller, we have to find ways to make, make them grow, make them bigger, right? So I completely, I completely agree with that. And also the books, and that's actually my next question. And maybe all of you can answer this question. You know, I've been quarantined for 36 days. I live alone. I have nowhere to go but toward my bookshelf in order to get through another day of boredom and anxiety. What texts or texts have been important to you recently? So, you know, just to, it's right into the question and kind of jumping off of the last one. There's a, there's a poem that, uh, that, that Chloe McKay wrote called Spring in New Hampshire. And, uh, and the, first, the first six lines, I think, go, uh, uh, too green, the April springing flowers, too blue, the silver speckled sky, to linger here, alas, while the happy winds go laughing by, Watch, uh, uh, watching the golden hours indoors, washing windows and scrubbing floors, right? So I'm thinking about the person who's writing that poem and what it means to be writing from a confined space, more or less, right? Because I'm free to go wherever I want, but I'm limited to go. I'm limited as to where I can go. Um, and thinking about what does it mean to write from an unfreedom space uh, in many ways, you know? So that's something that I've been thinking about. So. I've been reading some of McKay. I just, I'm three essays in into uh, Edwidge Dante Koch Create Dangerously. Uh, that's been pretty helpful right now. And then I started right around the beginning of the pandemic. There's an uh, author named Joseph Bla. He is a Spanish writer who came, who wrote a book during uh, the, the so-called Spanish flu, 1918. So what, he's, what he does, he's a student in Barcelona. He goes off to a coast uh, town where he grew up. Uh, in Spain. And he just keeps a diary for a whole year. I don't even know if he was thinking about publishing, but he had been prolific by that point. And all he does is just tap into his memory. All he does is tap into the town where he grew up. Uh, all he does in the genealogy of his name, uh, he starts thinking about um, what does that actually mean to be a writer uh, in the world, you know? So I think, you know, I'm, 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 I'm feeling like I'm just reading like a madman. I'm reading Salvage the Bones with my students right now. 
uh, by Jasmine Moore, a lot of poetry, uh, I think, in that book. And again, a sort of uh, a survival type narrative, uh, if you will, right? So um, these things are, are kind of keeping me company and I've been digging into my notebooks as well, uh, the old notebooks. And those are kind of what's coming out of there. It's like, just you have to go through a lot of sludge, by the way, but you kind of get one little gem uh, if you can find one on a good day. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I love, I love what Daniela was saying and I, and I kind of love what Willie's saying as well. And honestly, I move between movies and books because I think that it's hard for me lately to concentrate in that way, even though I admire like the writers who can, I feel like there are periods in which I can read and then there are periods in which, um, because reading feels so interior and I have such a desire to not be inside you know um like going to my backyard it's, <laughs> it's, and like talking to my cats is better but um yeah i have uh i have returned to poeta nueva york to federico garcia Lorca's uh poet in new york um because it was a book that shaped me multiple times throughout my life but also because it was a book that he wrote um you know, right, right around the time of the, the crash of the global market that preceded the Great Depression. And his response to that uh, through poetry is so strikingly similar to the current moment. And also, um, even if it's devastating, has, I don't know, something about the beauty and the intensity carries through in a way that feels healing to me, even if it's not maybe like necessarily what I would associate immediately with healing, but I think something in the writing um, you know, talking about eso, aquellos ojos míos de 1910, you know, no vieron enterrar a los muertos, no? Like uh, those eyes of mine of 1910 didn't see the, the dead being buried, right? Like that sort of like rapid change um, in a short time and that sort of response to, to something happening on a global space scale, you know, um, remind, I think it helped to remind me also that the apocalypse has, has happened before. Um, and, it, and there's something very uh, comforting in that in a way, right? That, that this does have an ending, that this does end at some point. Thank you. Tanelli, maybe you can tell some of the books you've been reading. Yeah, um, so I have been reading a lot of um, just like poem a day poems that come through my inbox. I, I mean, those have been giving me life and then a lot of the times they come with audio so I can hear the poet also read the poem, which again has really helped me to, you know, kind of get out of my own head. Um, and then I'm just going back to some old favorites. I actually was listening to um, Willie Perdomo's poem um, that's my heart right there. I was listening to that. I even posted about it the other day. And I think I listened to that poem at least like 10 times within an hour. And it was just so comforting to hear Willie's voice. Um, and that's just been one of my, my favorite uh, ones like through the year. So I just was really happy to continue to listen to it. Um, but I've also been reading uh, Natalie Diaz's new book, Post-Colonial Love Poem. Um, and then also a bit of Sharon Olds, her two latest collections, um, Odes and Arias. Um, again, I, I love how uh, she just writes about the body, especially the female body. Um, and she was one of my professors over at NYU and I consider her a fairy godmother of mine. Um, so it was just really nice to you know, be, be reading her work again um, and to think about it in relation to my work and hopefully they you know, spark something. Um, but those are the collections that I'm, I'm reading at the moment. Thank you, Janelle. Yeah, I think, um, interestingly, I've been, in terms of engaging poetry, I've been listening to a lot of craft talks. So I just listened to, just spent a few days listening to, Natalie Diaz has a talk on um, an emotional image. And it was great to kind of think about that. Um, for some reason, I think it's been, good for me to to take a, a step back from that um, in terms of poetry, but I've been reading a lot of YA. Um, I just finished um, Elizabeth Acevedo's With the Fire on High, and it was nice to kind of just remember like loving reading as a kid and that kind of joy that comes from delving into a book and like not, you know, looking up and just, I don't know, enjoying that in a way that feels like there's a lot more hope 
Um, so yeah. We'll see. Um, I've been reading, uh, one of the books that I finished reading was a book by Jenny Odell called How to Do Nothing, um, which I really loved because, um, you know, I think, I, I think I, I'm someone who often takes a lot of solace in being able to be productive and, 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 you know, generate new work and do a lot of different things. And, this during the pandemic i really have had to slow down for a number of reasons um i think you know one you know i was talking i was talking to uh to my dad earlier and i was telling him that like the housework never ends like i i cook every meal and then i wash dishes after every meal and it's just there's always housework so that's one thing um but it just, you know, I, I just feel very heavy. And I think like some of the other people were saying, I don't really want to spend a lot of time in my head. And so uh, that book was helpful in kind of trying to understand how productivity has been um, used as a, like used as a way to, has been weaponized against working people and working artists, I think, right? Um so that's been really helpful and has helped me kind of be kinder to myself. That's something that I'm trying to work on in general. Um, in terms of poetry, I find myself going back to Araceli Gilmay a lot, particularly Kingdom Animalia, which is one of my favorite, favorite books. Um, and then one of the one of the poems has, that has stayed with me the most during this time is June Jordan's poem, I Must Become a Menace to My Enemies. Um, it just feels very much kind of in the same spirit that I've, that I found myself. So those are some of the guideposts that, that I've been, uh, that have been important to me. Thank you. Definitely Araceli, so much joy in her work. Um, so I'll send the opportunity back to you because you have questions from the, from our viewers, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first I just want to say thank you once again uh, to all of the readers. Uh, thank you, Rigoberto. Um, I'm so excited. We got to hear new work from Rigoberto Gonzalez. Willie read a new poem. I think Raquel, that was a poem that was at least new to me. Um, so that was dope. Um, the first question from the audience is from Oris Acevedo, who asks, what would you say to young writers that believe they can't write poetry? So I'll throw that out to the whole panel. I'd say that there are poets who can't even read and write, and there always have been. Who, who, who's making them believe like that they can't write poetry? That's a, that's a question that, that they should answer, you know? I think when I felt like that um, as a teenager, I, it was important for me to remember that poetry is me telling my truths and telling the stories that I want to tell in the, the most clear or not clear way possible. It was just about getting that truth onto a page. And I think the more that you do that, the more that you start to feel like you have a voice, your own poetic voice that that is coming to life on the page. and that you can share with other people. Um, yeah. I think going back to the uh, poem that you read, Jose, earlier, um, poetry is like bread and it's for everyone. You know, um, I don't think that poetry is for the elite. Um, I think it's for everyone. I think everyone can write it, um, whether you're working class or not, you know, um, it doesn't matter. Um, I think it's just important that you write um, and kind of like what Janelle was saying, um, writing down your truth is so important. Um, I started writing in a journal and I never thought that I would be a poet at all. I never imagined that, but writing was just something that was so important to me and that's why I did it. Um, and I think that that's the first step is just write for you um, and see if it, like where it takes you. Um, we're, we're all poets. Cool.
cool. Um, so the next question is from Arturo de Simone, who asks, do you think there is a nearby future for bilingual poetry or bilingual literature within Puerto Rico among the readers of the young generation on the island itself? Yes, that's like specifically to me. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, the problem is that most people um, in Puerto Rico speak Spanish and not that much English. And that doesn't mean that there aren't bilingual poets that write in English. You know, I think of Ana Portnoy and I think of a lot of um, kind of younger poets that kind of um, move between languages. And I think that that's, you know, always existed to some extent. Um, I, I think it's just a little complicated because of, you know, the history of English in Puerto Rico and um, the the attempted imposition of English in Puerto Rico, which is a very different situation um, in many ways in the diaspora. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's always a future for, for poetry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the next two questions, I think I'll kind of, I'll read them together since I think they kind of go together. So Melissa Castillo Planas asks, I want to know more about how they thought about the organization of the book, the sections, themes, etc. And then Sofia Aguilar asks, what was the inspiration behind using Loteria cards to divide up the various themes of the anthology? And Willie, I'll let you take that one. Um. I think for the first thing that we had to kind of consider in terms of how to organize the book was how generational was the book going to be. So if we're writing, if we're in a series called the Breakbeat series and there's a level of, you know, quote unquote hip hop poetics that come with that, uh, who was going to be included in that discussion? So if we look at, uh, you know, a definition of hip hop poetics, even at its most basic, um, the one thing is there's a level of witness going on there, right? The other part is there is a level of storytelling whereby it's somewhat autobiographical um, and you are here to tell the world, a world that is bent on pretty much erasing your existence, that you're still here, right? So that's part of, you know, what went into the kind of organization. We know we knew we wanted a range of... Um, of voices, we wanted a range of aesthetics, and we definitely wanted to embrace uh, the blackness of our communities as well in terms of our afro latinidad because in many ways that has been kind of excluded from discussion un until people like Melissa come along with these anthologies that kind of break open that discussion a little bit more. And if I remember, the Loteria was a dope concept. I think I was in California, we were talking about it, and suddenly we were talking about the cards as a way to kind of split up in sections and all of us like, word, that's going to, that's actually going to work kind of cool right now, you know? And thematically, the poems that we were receiving kind of fit in with uh, the themes of each Loteria card, you know? So um, if I remember that, I remember just having that discussion and how excited we all were on it. I think it was a three-way conversation and that this is going to work really well. So we had to fit within the aesthetic of the Break Me Poet series. We had to consider the generational kind of range of the book, the aesthetic range of the book, the level of, uh, you know, resistance in terms of the politics of, you know, how does one define authenticity? How does one define uh, Latinidad uh, or being Latinx? Um, and then, you know, the sections helped us out kind of uh, provide a framework for a lot of the poems that were coming through. Yeah, and then I'll just add on about the Loteria cards. Part of the kind of inspiration for using Loteria cards was instead of breaking down the book into thematic sections that were perfectly straightforward. So these are the poems that reference pop culture. These are the poems, you know, that talk about gender or whatever. Um, we wanted to, you know, one, like the Loteria cards are, are something um, that kind of play on various cultural practices and then two kind of make it so that you know you come up to La Sirena section and then you know maybe you have to consider you know what exactly it kind of puts a little bit more work on the reader I think for them to kind of figure out exactly what the connections are it doesn't make it 
it doesn't kind of give the answer right away. So I think that was part of like artistically, I think it looks good. And then I think it shifts some of the work onto the reader. Um, so the next question is, and I think this is open to everybody. What is your self editing editing process? Like that's from Jose Rico. What is your self editing editing process? Like. I'll just start, you know, when I talk to my students, I always uh, sort of define a, 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 a two, two ways, and there's all kinds of ways in between, but you know, there's those of us that, that have told me drafts, physical drafts on the, on the desk. You know, we write and we do, do it again, and that's, a, that's one way, right? And for me, I'm the kind of person that has to revise in my head. So by the time I actually get on on the page or on the computer, it's already the fifth or sixth draft. And it doesn't mean I write the whole poem. It's just a, a couple of lines, right? And that's how you do it. Just think about it, think about it, then get in there and write that and, get, and, and put, it on the, put it on the page. And then eventually the poem kind of becomes, comes to life. Now I've got enough on the page there that I can see or the poem can see where it's headed. So the path has been built and then I just continue. That's my way. Uh, I think I do a lot of, um, it, it helps me not to, you know, I get like a, like a, I guess like a, I get stuck if I am too self-critical. Um, and so part of what I do is I kind of trick myself by treating poems like um, spaces for play and a space in which I can play and sort of be free in that play. Um, and that really helps me because even when I'm editing, right, um, it, it takes off some of the pressure to make the poem perfect when, when I see it as um, something that ultimately should bring me joy. So that's a key part of my self-editing process is to try and like remind myself it's, it's about the joy um, in writing, even when I'm writing about something heavy. I think for me, they, the best editor that I've ever had is time. Um, I will write a poem. Um, I don't, depending, I might feel really great about it. I might feel awful about it, but then I just put it away and I, I take time um, and don't look at it for, for a while, whether it's a week or a month, um, sometimes even six months. And then I come back to it with fresh eyes and I'm ready to, um, really think about the poem, um, like the craft of the poem versus maybe not the story I was trying to tell or how like emotionally attached I might be to the subject matter. Um, and that to me has been really helpful. Um, sometimes it is really hard to stay away from a poem for a little bit, but it, I have seen results in that way where I am able to look at it with a more critical eye when I give myself a little bit of space from the work, especially considering that I do write about such heavy subject matter, um, I can become really emotionally invested in the poem as I should be, but then I do forget about that craft portion that I need to think about and time for me has definitely been the, the best of help for that. Yeah, I have. Y'all might be able to see, but like, uh, there, I think there's a shadow right behind me. You see that, right? Because I, I think I got this lit all wrong, probably. But I'm, I'm, I'm pointing it out to say that when you do sit down to write, there's always that shadow kind of lingering and shit just in the back, saying, you know, you can't say that. You can't write that. No one's gonna look at. It. No one's gonna like it. And I think that's the conversation that you need to be having during that. Uh, self-editing process you know who's who's on the shoulder telling you who's gazing and saying nah you can't you, you that's not going to sound right uh those words put together that way just won't work uh that content the the subject is too risky you know who's who, who who's saying that i think it's important to kind of listen to that voice and and just as an add-on just in terms of you know this book being in conversation with a level of hip-hop poetics again like any good cipher uh when you're in it, there's a range of voices kind of in that cipher. And we wanted that for the anthology. It's a broad, broad, broad range of voices. I just wanted to add that to clarify, but um, but speak to the shadow. Uh, 
I think um, for me, so much of editing is a really collaborative process. Um, so first, like I'm asking myself, have I said everything that I want to say in this poem? Have I pushed this poem as much as I possibly can on my own? Um, and sometimes, you know, I might have a, a line or a, a set of stanzas even where I'm like, I know what I'm trying to do here, but I, and I know I'm not doing it yet, but it's here, right? And I think at that point, having like friends, people read it over and say like, hey, you know, I really like this line or, you know, I have a question about this. I think that's where I start to see, oh, okay. Like, you know, sometimes my friends are pointing out to me things that I'm like, I didn't even know I was doing that, but cool. Like, you know, um, so I think it's just bringing in that collective process for me also makes the writing less lonely. I think that's important. Word. Um, the one thing I'll add on to what everybody else said is, for me, I like revising out loud. It helps me, if I can listen to the poem, it helps me see spots where maybe the language doesn't fit quite right. Um, or sometimes, you know, the sounds will lead me towards a different place that might help me break away from, you know, maybe the facts of the story and help me kind of figure out what's underneath the facts, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, we're, we're running out of time. So I just wanted to uh, say thank you one more time to all of our poets. Um, you know, make sure you check out all of their work uh, one more time, wherever you're at. I want you to put your hands together for Rigoberto Gonzalez. Give it up, give it up. Uh, give it up for Janelle Pineda. Give it up for Dianelli Antigua, for Raquel Salas Rivera, for Willy Perdomo. My name is Jose Olivares, and uh, you're tuned in to Haymarket Books. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. Go get the anthology. It's 30% off right now. Uh, go get all of these wonderful people's books and future books. Thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you so much for tuning in. If we didn't get to your question, you know, you can always message us on Twitter or on Instagram or wherever. Um, be well, take good care of yourselves. Y nos vemos pronto, ¿no? Thank you. Thank you, Jose.